Hello and welcome to today's briefing, Future of Work Corporate Affairs. I see we have a really big audience joining us today, so I will just hold on for a moment whilst everyone gets into the V-Vent. Wait for those numbers to climb. Okay, and I think I can begin as everyone is joining. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome. I'd like to acknowledge the original custodians of this land. I'm coming to you from the land of the Eora people, and I pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the hopes, visions and traditions of Indigenous Australia. This today is one of the most important and topical conversations that we've had so far in our series, and we're excited to be working with our partners at Comtrack to bring you today's session. I think we're all kind of all feel like we're at a turning point, but we still don't know what the future holds. How will businesses function over the next year and beyond? What elements will remain from before COVID? What elements will fundamentally change? Today, we've got a great discussion surrounding that, and we're joined by our corporate affairs panel of amazing women, Louisa Meagle, who's Group Head of Corporate Affairs and Marketing for Lendlease, Annie O'Rourke, Chief Executive Officer, 89 Degrees East, Anna Whitlam, Founder and Managing Director of Adam Whitlam People and Non-Executive Director for Comtrack. And today we'll be moderated by Vanessa Liel, who's Executive Director for Comtrack and former co-founder of Herd MSL. Don't forget to place your questions in the Q&A feature down the bottom of your screen. We'll get to those as we, as we go along the discussion. And I know it's going to be a full discussion, a robust discussion today. So let's get started. Over to you, Vanessa, and enjoy today's event. Thank you very much, Tracy. We're delighted to be here today. Um, my name is Vanessa Lyle. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I represent Comtract, which is a digital platform that connects more than 4,000 highly skilled communication, marketing, creative and digital media experts to project work. And today is about the future of work. We're very delighted um, to welcome three communication industry leaders to share their insight into the impact of COVID on corporate communications and the way we will work in the future. Um, Anna, Louisa, and Annie brings significant industry experience along with really unique insight from the Australian and international market, both in-house and agency. The way we're going to run today is to spend a little time with each of our guests um, to understand their perspective. We will then move to a panel discussion and then open that up to audience questions. So please put them in and, and we will address them at that later point. So I'd like to start with Anna. Um, you're very closely connected with leaders across corporate affairs and organisations both in Australia and, and um, APAC. Um, can you let us know how you've seen COVID-19 impact communication leaders? Such a big question, such an open question that doesn't necessarily have a start and a finish. First of all, I just want to say thank you to Contract and Trans-Tasman Business Circle for bringing us all together today. It's such a... Um, a wonderful opportunity to share what we're all seeing and also to have you as an amazing audience um, participate in the discussion. So the, the first thing that I just wanted to start by saying is that this disruption was already happening. Um, digital disruption was driving change um, like uh, never before. And I think what's happened with COVID is it's just essentially sped that up which has been a catalyst to um, further change. It's really enabled our discipline for the first time to be valued at levels, not for the first time, but to be valued at levels that it hasn't been previously. And I think for those of you who are in internal comms, you know, the poor cousins of our discipline, finally, there's an opportunity to really demonstrate your value to your executive. I think that, you know, part of um, what we have struggled with as communications professionals is the isolation piece to COVID, as comms leaders um, by our, you know, and, I, and a, lot of, a lot of you will have heard me talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs previously. I mean, our base needs are really all about feeling secure. And as part of being a communicator, we like to communicate. So being thrown into isolation has certainly put a lot of pressure on our abilities to interact and work with our colleagues. However, it's really put emphasis on the need to stay connected through digital channels, which we should all be leaders in anyway. And so again, you know, there was an article in the BBC um, earlier this week in relation to the increase in uptake clearly from digital channels through this and, and, and the change that it will enable 
with leaders in our organisations just using things and operating in ways that we've never actually operated in before that we should have been doing previously, but that were not on doorstep to actually force us to change in this way. The other big change that I've seen for leaders and those of you who have been leading the response for your organisations on the front line is just this intense um, marathon that you're all running at the moment and the propensity to burn out um, and, the, and the need for you as leaders to look after yourselves and to look after your teams. Unfortunately, with an event like uh, COVID or the, you know, a pandemic, there is no certainty around when it's going to change. There's no certainty around what the next step is going to be. And, you know, a lot of the research actually says that we feel more comfortable with uh, knowing that we're going into surgery or something with a known end than actually operating within an uncertain world. And so we, you know, we have to actually maintain our stamina, we have to maintain the resilience and stamina of our teams, and we also have to do that for our leaders. The other big change that we've, we've observed is the need for CEOs, the need for communications leaders to work closely with CEOs and business leaders on their consistent, authentic leadership which again, you know, is really shining on the S in ESG in terms of how we're going to operate moving forward. A lot of leaders haven't ever worked in an environment like this before. They've never had or been thrust, you know, to the front to lead um, response, to provide certainty to thousands and thousands of employees and some in, you know, multiple countries, and multiple geographies. And so again, um, you know, they're turning to us to try and help them understand and navigate. And a lot of people that I'm talking to are not sure and don't know. And so it's really, I guess, about trying to be the leader that can try and provide um, some sense of security and support, understand that there are no answers. And so it's better to have a go than not to have a go. And to also just relish this opportunity and make the most of it. Because again, this is the first time that we have really been uh, recognised at such a significant level. I mean, even if you Google, um, you know, communications change during COVID. I've never seen so many articles around the world that actually refer to the highlight, you know, of our discipline and what we can actually do to impact reputation and risk moving forward. Um, the final point I think that I just wanted to mention is that for us as communicators, um, there is no going back to normal. This is the new normal. And the best way that we can actually respond to that is by continuing to be agile, open in our thinking, um, open in our style, connected to our colleagues and our teams, and, and, and also understanding that there is no, you know, our roles don't fit within boxes anymore. You know, it's not about us as a function, it's about us as leaders servicing a business to also navigate a world that they don't quite understand. That's fantastic. And, and probably, I mean, you touched on many things there, Anna, but I would like to pull out of that. You know, what capabilities and behaviours do you think leaders are going to need to navigate this crisis successfully? So again, I think, I mean, these are kind of the key capabilities and, and um, behaviours that leaders in successful communications functions need anyway, but there is, um, and much greater focus on this and, and also very strong alignment with what our CEOs and business leaders are needing. So, you know, a focus very much on being agile and using good judgment, clearly. Now, remembering that when we're burnt out and we're tired, um, we don't use good judgment. So it's one in the same thing in terms of looking after yourselves and looking after your own stamina to ensure that you're actually providing the advice and the service to our organisations that we expect from us. Um, an ability to influence, obviously, and operate and work with multiple stakeholders simultaneously. So I can't emphasise enough, and I know you've all heard this a billion times, but I'm going to say it again, um, know your customer. You know, there is never a time like now where um, understanding our audiences um, has been important because I think things that we had predicted to happen haven't necessarily happened. And I think we need to bring things right back down to the basics and appreciate that our customers are our neighbours, um, are the people that we stand next to on trams and trains, are the people we stand next to. So that it's, it's being, you know, bringing the humanity back into how we think about things. So not turning to a business model to find an answer, but trying to think about what you would do in that situation. So bringing everything down. Political sensitivity, um, I mean, again, 
you know, the world is going through a crazy time of geopolitical change, which is just going to continue in the same way. So operating in a bubble is not going to work. You know, thinking about how you can continue to manage yourself from a currency perspective, bringing the outside in is, is the best way. So going, operating on an internal mindset is not going to be helpful, not just in COVID, but in general, you know, it's so, so important. Um, and then the final point is, which I'm loving right now, um, is having grit. And I think communications leaders do have really good grit. So there's a wonderful author, Angela Duckworth, that many of you may know about, who's written a book on grit, and combine, which, which essentially combines resilience and passion. This is not an opportunity, this, this is not a time where we all need to be, you know, meeting or blowing things out of the park every single day. This is a time where we have to be resilient over the long term. We have to be very focused. We have to love what we do. We have to bring passion to what we do. Otherwise, we're not going to survive because, again, it is us who our leaders are turning to to provide direction, to help solve problems, that is you know, to help them mitigate, make decisions around risk that can help you know, from a board perspective right down to um, the mailman, so to speak, within our organisations. So I hope that I haven't rambled too much in that sense. Very well said, very well said. So Louisa, you are head of corporate communications and marketing and you have a very large and integrated team with diverse skills. What's this year meant to you? What's been the impact of COVID on your function? Oh, probably from the, the start, I'm gonna echo a little bit of what um, Anna has said that from the beginning, we had to really lean into the business. You know, call, you know I always call internal comms occasionally, like the, you know, the Marsha Brady, she's the one in the, Jan Brady, the one in the middle. Um, but we've had to lean so far into the business. And I use the concept for sweat equity, that the board needed updates from us consistently, that um, the, the senior leadership team needed updates. But more importantly, in a time where people didn't know who to trust, right? The government, should we open, should we close? No, no one, there was no one in authority who knew, think of the early days of this, who knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a global business. So we hit Asia hard, hit our Asia business very early. Um, so Lendlease as a company took decisions before governments did. And they took decisions about the safety and welfare of our people, which is kind of you know, in deep DNA. But we did that early and it spoke to me about the fact that our employees were trusting us um, very swiftly as a source of information and data. And that came with an awesome responsibility for me and my team to make sure that working closely with our risk team very early on, we were making, I keep calling it 100% decisions with 50% data. And we had to be really comfortable with that. And, you know, corporate affairs and marketing always marries marry data with instinct, you know, like where does that hit? So we really came to our fore and making deep recommendations that were going to have a long-term impact on our business. Um, so the team, not dissimilar to probably lots of teams on this call, really did lean into the business, really did get this rush of productivity. You know, the, the, those first three or four um, weeks were extraordinary. They were 20 plus hour days. They were um, we were exhausted by our own incredible productivity. We've had to come to a normalisation. And what we've really learned is what really is important and what's going to drive this business and what are all those lovely, nice things to do that we've always done before that have just gotten in our way. So, and this is replicated across our business. When I speak to my peers across their businesses, things that would have taken, you know, months and months of double checking and this steer steering committee and this project control group just getting accelerated. So it shows us what we can do. So the kind of the model about we've all had to, we didn't try to replicate the office experience from home. Um, we started talking about what is digital, what is not digital and how, how does this stay forward? Like how do you operate in an environment where there is so much uncertainty um, and make people feel really comfortable? And one example I'd love to give is, you know, like lots of companies, we have the big employee events with our CEO and senior leadership team and the, the, the communication has always been a bit of a cascade from top to bottom, um, but through different channels. But with the people embracing a digital workplace, it's from the CEO straight to the individual on the front line. We've run these Ask Me Anythings with our CEO, um, which are incredibly humanising for him. People get to see 
you know, how the sausage gets made. He's really open, honest, and authentic. Um, it's been quite an extraordinary journey and we're not letting any of that stuff go. So we've gotten very close to business. Um, we're lucky as a function, we sit on the global leadership team. We report um, in and support the board. So we've always been a bit close to the action, but there's been a really intensity that what we do, you know, come at the hour, come at the team. And we stepped into that breach, particularly on the corporate and government affairs side um, to be incredibly useful. As a leader, the one thing I'd like to say is the people, when I talk about utility and use, I always think we're in the service game. Um, those individuals from a career point of view, if you're thinking about this from a career point of view, the, the deepest utility players were the ones who have been head and shoulders above, that they were people who could do more than one thing and just leaned in and said, what solution can I provide? Not what can I do, what solution can I provide to the problem? And I've just seen extraordinary performance. And as a leader, making future decisions about resourcing, I'm going to remember this moment. I'm going to remember those who leaned in. And that's for all of us. If it's not just me as a leader, my boss is going to remember this team leaned, leaned in at the time of the greatest need. Government will remember we stood up and said, can we build you a hospital? What do you need? We'll do it at cost. Whatever you need, we're going to do. That's a reputation reset, both for the function internally but for how we engage with our external customers. Um, and I've, I watch maniacally like our um, scores for customer satisfaction in retirement, living in retail, in all of the areas where we touch consumers. Um, and this period of time, there's been such a reputation bump opportunity. Now I've got to talk about how we keep that going. How do we keep that tracking forward? Um, so it's, I hate, I really despise the expression, I'm going to use it, never waste a crisis. Um, but just the, the function, I want to ask everyone on this call, lean into this and not just with that creative idea, but look forward now. We're, we're past the first flush of the crisis and for the Australians and New Zealanders, maybe we get a pandemic premium. So maybe Australia is a great place to do business. Maybe Australia and New Zealand are a great place to visit if you're in the tourism game. I know a few people on the call are. Maybe that's what we need to focus on and take to our business ideas based on the future, not just, you know, yes, the business is all worried about the next six to 12 months and what does it look like, but how we help them doing what's urgent, but never forget what's important mm -hmm. because those of us who can do that and who understand the business are going to really elevate the function and their own individual careers. So many great points in that. I think one for me is the, you know, we think about the reputation for our organisation, but what you've raised is like, what's the reputation of your function? Yeah. And I think in, you know, one thing around crisis is, yeah, people's memories are really heightened and, you know, there will be memories around not only what was achieved, but what the behaviour was at this point in time. And I'm interested because you've touched, you, you have a very big remit and, and you, what you've touched on is a lot of demands on you personally and on your team, both from the board, from um, the, the executive team, as well as from the organisation to be able to deliver the business as usual, as well as to, you know, adequately respond to what, you know, we all hope for, um, but which won't happen is a, is a crisis where, where we are able to test those, those amazing skills. But I'm very interested, you know, how do you ensure that you've got the right skills to deliver the full range of communication services that your function requires? You've touched on utility of your team yeah. which is about broadening their skills about diversity about getting that experience but one of the things we note is is that you know our functions do require deep specialization so how do you go about forming that that function well i get the benefit of having um corporate affairs marketing government affairs under one umbrella which by the way i kind of think is a trend they're not your enemy if they're, if they're corporate affairs people on this call the marketers are not your enemy they're truly not um, in fact, when you combine forces, you do better. Um, and so when I think about um, the specialisations inside of each team, it comes together at digital. And you know who, who the future threat for our function is, I'm really honest? It's the chief digital officer, guys. That's the future, that's the future threat. Um, we're the advice givers. We rely on this level of creativity and deep um, insight um, and relationship. But you marry that with the data, 
discipline that marketing brings and that real focused on I will make decisions, I will bore you with the amount of data and research and insight I'm bringing to the table, bring them two together and there is a real unstoppable way. Um, it goes from being I'm an individual contributor because I've got all this creativity or I'm, I'm the one with all the insight to I am an unstoppable force as a function. Um, and I said before, I get the benefit of being on the senior leadership team, but so much of our function deserves that seat, deserves it and never gets it. You know, we're reporting into legal or into finance or some other weird function. Um, we're not smart or as attractive as us, um, but we aren't actually having that reputation seat around the table. What this has given us is that seat and we're never to lose it. And so we partner with those inside and outside of the business you know, you can't do it all yourself. Stop thinking you can. Um, no need to be a glory hog either because the shared collective of what you can get done is so much stronger. And I've just seen corporate affairs team in particular, and to be honest, prior to this job, I probably could be a bit guilty of that. So to all the marketers I've worked with in the past, I apologise profusely, um, not to, to share with them. And that's including our agency partners. Like we've got some amazing partners we work with. We can't do it all. And they, they've become part of a business and they dip in and they dip out, but we trust them. So we've amassed that skill by being able to collectively work together. And Anna said it so beautifully at the beginning, the trends we're seeing now are trends that were always in train, like always. So the digital train has left that station some time ago, but a lot of us were actually a bit scared to get on it yeah. um, and, and hung back and it was for someone else to do. Um, and what I'm trying to do with my team is say, deepen your utility. Um, you know, it's not enough just to say, oh, I understand what SEO means. How does it work? And, you know, and let's be very clear. I'm always finding people in the business. There's a few of them on this call who may laugh at this. I'm always calling and saying, can I have half an hour where you can tell me what it is you're doing? Um, and I don't want a pretty deck. And I just tell me, get me into the weeds because I need to be able to explain it at a different level in the organisation. And I need to make sure that I'm credible and not just what's the expression, Easter egg, shiny on the outside, push a little hard and there's nothing, that, you know, it all, it all falls down. So the function needs to be more data driven. Um, and if everyone forgets anything I've said on this call, I don't mind, but if you can remember just one thing, get underneath the numbers. Actually, you don't need to be a finance person, but truly understand how your business makes money and how what you do provides a solution, something that people in agency have always had to know because you've had to understand the business. And I think inside, in-house people tend to forget that you, we're working for a listed company. I can't, I don't get any credibility sitting around the, the board table or the global leadership table talking about clicks and likes or, or relationship with this person unless I can translate that into what problem this solves. But you're standing up big ask for money, setting up big programs, big campaigns I want to run with a, with a serious check attached to them. What's the return? And I think corporate affairs, marketing is good at that. Corporate affairs is less good at the return because it's grey. And that's okay. There may not be an immediate return. Think about government affairs, long burn. Um, but you've got to talk about how this helps the business using the language of whatever your business is. So my passion point, sorry, Vanessa. Very good. No, I had quite a few headlines out of that. I did like the pandemic premium as well. Yeah. Like, <laughs> something. I've stolen um, that from my CEO. It's not mine. I'm actually stolen right. it from him. But we'll go. take it. That's a, it's a lot we can do with that. Um, it probably is timely, timely to, to turn to Annie. You founded 89 Degrees East following a career as a political advisor and they've grown that agency, um, which we're all very jealous of from your base in, in Byron Bay. Um, and employed professionals with diverse skills and locations um, to deliver large campaigns for government and um, for other clients. Um, Louisa touched on it there in terms of um, what the, um, I guess, in-house functions can learn from agency. I feel like I've just lost Annie. She'll dial back in. Okay. Um, 
I might just go to one last question that I had for you, Louisa, which was, um, you know, what's top of mind for you when you enter the second half of the year? Obviously, your leadership over the first six months has been critical, as for many organisations, as they understand what's happening at a, at a macro level and what that means for the organisation. However, I think, to be fair, it's probably the next six months that is going to be critical for all of us in terms of what happens next. So what's on your mind? Uh, probably three big things. One is... Um, ESG has not been pushed to the back burner. Like it's the community have expectations, shareholders have expectations. So we probably need to step into that. And I noticed Annie's back. So I'm going to let you go back to Annie and um, I can talk about my, I can talk forever. I can give me a microphone. I'll never shut up. All right, we'll come back to it. So Annie, we were talking about what corporate and, and organisations can learn from agency, particularly around um, you know, the commercial side of, of the value that we deliver. Um, in, in building your agency, you know, what, what do you think have been the key learnings and, and um, what do you think we could learn from that in terms of agile working, in terms of creativity, innovation, and I guess the commercialisation of, of our value? Yeah. Um, well, one of the, uh, you know, reflecting on this before this um, webinar, one of the things that um, I really thought about is about how it's so important about quality, not quantity, um, when it comes to your team. And um, I think that's a really, the, you know, really good way of looking at the go forward. I think the best thing I've done over the 10 years of running 89 Degrees East is sort of use a criteria when hiring about, you know, choosing people who are a leader in their field, someone who's got a really deep understanding of public discourse and also really importantly um, that, you know, they're fundamentally decent human beings because I want to work with them. I want to learn from them and I want my clients to also enjoy working and learning with them. And I think that um, that is a really um, uh, important for corporate teams to really uh, spend some time on working what's best for, you know, what's a new fit for them and, and what's that new team look like um, and getting the sort of experience and equation right um, with the culture right. So I think that um, smaller agencies have often spent a bit of time with that because they've got to work so much closely and sometimes big corporate affairs teams gets away with having sort of um, uh, not everyone pulling their weight or not having little, um, you know, fights between marketing and corporate, you know, and things like that. And I do totally agree that the, the uh, you know, working in teams, working together, having really good qualities that stick together um, is something that agents, you know, running an agency, I've really learned how to do. Having previously before this, you know, worked, I've worked in big government agencies, I've worked in corporate and even working in politics you know, this important thing about getting the right people together um, is, you know, um, is really critical. Um, I think the other thing that's been really important for me as someone who has um, moved to Byron Bay and then tried to run a national business from here is to be really... Um, Um, but it's critical to keep everyone on the same page and enables the cross fertilization of ideas, which means we I'm getting a message that my internet isn't stable, which is such a problem in um, uh, today, but normally it's fantastic. But let me know, Vanessa, if there's a problem um, and I'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. But basically that internal communications is, is really critical, but not just saying it, but actually, you know, really living it and finding a way to put structure around it so that everyone can benefit. And then also your clients can benefit is really important. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about is uh, industry more generally, that I think COVID has actually opened up opportunities um, for more flexible remote firms like us to be impact players to if someone's looking for a particular skill or a particular ability, um, the opportunity um, for corporate organisations is to actually dip in and, and bring in that skill to their team. Um, and COVID's really sped that process up that it doesn't matter where people are. If they've got the right skill set, mindset, you know, to join your team, 
um, you can pull that team together instead of sort of saddling up with a long-term agency. Um, and this shouldn't be seen as a threat, you know, because I know a lot of agencies have um, worked on retainers and, you know, just servicing. Um, but actually, you know, there's such a great opportunity. It's an exciting evolution whereby teams can work on multiple work streams and cross um, pollinate and bring skills. And we're not sort of um, in deep competition so much with each other, but actually looking, oh, you know, um, I might be working with, you know, X on this project and I might work with X on this project. Um, is, is That's the exciting thing. You know, it's our own sort of version of the gig economy. And we should really see that as a strength. And I hate to use this um, sporting analogy, but it's really true that, you know, for a long time, like the football teams or the basketball teams or netball teams, they had the starting team and then they called it the bench player. But now they've, that, that language has really changed around to really smart coaches. They call them impact players, people who can come in from the bench and at a particular time and do a particular project. And I think that um, corporates, um, you know, really smart corporates are probably, you know, a lot of them are already doing this but corporates as a whole can look for who's their impact player, who can help them. It might be just for a couple of weeks. It might be, you know, longer depending. Um, it might be a couple of times the, throughout the year, but not ongoing. And um, I'm really excited about that impact player opportunity. Fantastic. Well, it, it does lead to, I guess, pulling some of the themes together. And the reason that we're here is that we have really accelerated or, you know, the, the COVID and, and the economic downturn has really accelerated what was happening anyway in our industry. And the, the discussion today is really around us being prepared for what happens next. And, and what we've touched on is the strength of, of technical skills and, and being able to evolve those in a way that stays relevant to your organisation and, and creates currency in what you're doing. But probably most importantly about behaviours and um, we've all experienced the impact now of working from home and there's been significant discussion and, and in my mom, mind a little alarming discussion around how this is going to change our future and perhaps we're all going to be working at a computer um, in our Ugg boots and, and maybe going into a hot desk office every now and then when we feel like it. But putting that aside, you know, what do you think the changes in the work and the economic downturn are going to mean for corporate communication professionals? What do we need to think about and what do we need to be prepared for? And are we right perhaps to start, you know, to, to start imagining that kind of future at this point in time or, or should we be thinking differently? So that's really a question to the panel. Yeah. Well, I would want to say just first up that like coming out of COVID, most companies, government agencies, organisations we work with, there's not one of those who aren't thinking about how they can significantly reduce their cost base in the coming years. Um, and, you know, there'll be, there'll be a lot of corporate affairs um, teams that are looking to half their team, you know. Um, and so, but at the same time, there wouldn't be a corporate affairs unit in Australia that hasn't dramatically increased its workload and output over the past few months. And there's no end in sight of that dynamic changing. Um, less people, more work. It's yet another sort of new post-COVID um, post fact of life. So for agencies like ours, now's the time to assist organisations on how they can achieve more for less. And it's, you know, it's our turn to be part of the productivity agenda. Um, in its simplest sense, like the agency model can deliver, you know, subject matter expertise, um, insights from outside the company bubble flexible working arrangements without the sort of burden of permanent contracts and the cost overheads associated with having employees in your head office. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, the biggest thing is always to not to retreat and think of it as a threat, but think of it as an opportunity. It, the realistic um, fact is it's, got, it's going to change dramatically numbers of staff and work and teams and the makeup of teams. And so, you know, spending time now working on that and playing to your strengths is going to be really critical. And Anna, what's your view on this? I mean, you're obviously in that of a lot of organisations and working very closely with senior professionals. Uh, what's your view? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what Annie has just shared and very similar to what Louisa has shared also. 
Um, they call it, and a lot of the research that's coming out now, they call it the Hollywood model, and I'm seeing this play out, just like in Hollywood, you know, they go and get the best actors around the world for a period of time to deliver on a movie. Um, we'll be doing the same. I think we're seeing organisations that will have a very tight um, centre of excellence. There is always going to be a role for the top team in our discipline because the CEO and the group exec will want um, you know, a trusted advisor. But what that person will do is obviously buy in their resources based on what the particular strength in certain areas are required. So a move back towards specialization. But when I talked earlier about an ability and an agility to solve for problems, what I talk about is that it doesn't matter what the problem is and where the problem sits. If you're predominantly an externally focused comms leader, you need to understand how you repurpose that capability to an internal environment. So it's all about solving a problem and not thinking about my channel. Um, and within that, we're seeing in China right now, the whole of middle management disappearing. So, you know, it's about rather than having, and to Annie's earlier point, how do we get rid of overhead? How do we get rid of liabilities that then create all the liability off our balance sheets, which are having permanent employees that when, if there's a crisis or another pandemic, we're not feeling as choked on from a cost perspective. Yeah. So how do we get much more efficient? How do we access the best possible talent to deliver on that project, you know, within a very short space of time? And it is going to be things like contract where people are, or agencies like Annie's where people will actually um, buy resources. And I think I, it's really important that I say too, and just reiterate, I don't see this as a major risk for firms like mine or for yourselves as leaders and practitioners. The message that I really want to share is that we need to take it on board as individuals and as a collective to ensure that we invest in our own self-development and that we manage our own careers, that we build our own career currency by looking outside rather than relying on our organisations to provide a, the road for us. Because those days, um, as my husband keeps reminding me, the party is over. Um, and those days are well and truly over. You know, we are responsible for ourselves. We need to think about what we can bring into this new environment and make the most of it. You know, for those of us who have, um, who are used to travelling a lot like me, you know, I'm, I am actually loving being more present at home with family. I mean, it's quite amazing, you know, and all of a sudden, who would have thought, you know, that that opportunity would present itself. And I'm also thinking about moving to Byron Bay um, because Annie's made it all possible. So I, I, I'm trying to think myself about these sorts of, um, you know, silver linings as well. Great. And is that our, our future, Louisa? Like, are we all going to move to the country and um, zoom no. in? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't um, but yeah, I'm really interested, you know, you're, you're running a workplace and, yep. and you're in the office and, um, you know, I'm really interested in terms of your team. Do you think we could be completely remote or how do you think it's going to work in the future? Actually, Vanessa, not only do I run a workplace, I work for a company that builds office buildings and builds precincts and does urban environments. So I think I have a lot to say on this topic. <laughs> um, but from a, um, but from genuinely from a team point of view, Corporate affairs and marketing, it's a contact sport. You need trusted relationships have to happen. Like the, the, the collective group of us, we've worked together before. We know each other. So trust in the physical world has just translated really easily to trust in the new world. I want to touch on some point about how graduates and new starters get in because if you're in this digital world for a long time, it's going to be really hard. But there is, the way I'm looking at the future of work is portfolio, actually. And by portfolios, there's a team of us who have got to write our annual report and your report's got to be produced. So that means there's finance people, there's um, you know, auditors, there's my team of writers, my team of digital designers, um, me and a few t people who have oversight of the delivery. At some point, we have to physically come together. You can do all those component parts remotely, but the collaboration must come together. You know, at the early parts, we were together deciding what to do and now we physically want to be in the same space don't want to share our numbers over an internet connection. So there's that portfolio, it's coming together. But what this has debunked is that I need everybody with me all the time. And I've had a global team for such a long time that there's always been a huge element with me of digital teams that they're not physically with me. But trust has gone up. 
I have to have more discipline. So what really is going to happen isn't about are we going to be together or not, but for the Annie impact player model to work, which I'm so stealing Annie. Um, but for that to truly work, it means as a leader, I have to be incredibly disciplined about what is it I'm trying to achieve? So what piece do I need? When do I need to call Annie and say, I need you to do this bit and I need you guys to do that bit. So as a leader, being the conductor of the orchestra, when they're all in front of you, is, is a relatively easy task. Being the conductor of an orchestra and understanding this is a new score and I may not even know the full answer. I may not know how it's all going to play out, but I've got to get the musicians in. I'm, I can't do a sporting analogy, Annie, everyone knows I can't. So I'm going to go for the arts. But um, getting that into the table, um, that's, that's going to be different because consumers, what, what we're seeing right now, I, I've got the benefit of a research team as well, is that there's a real attitude shift to how we live, how we work, how we're going to shop, um, how we're going to come together and entertain ourselves. But attitudes are not behaviours. Behaviours take a very long time to move and, cons and humanity is a pack animal. So, you know, dipping in and out is about right actually that we don't always need to be together we've proven the model we've proven annie's model works but we're still going to need to come together there isn't i don't see any future where it's a completely um, digital environment um, humanity is always needed to come together for creativity for um, relationship for trust that will still to me happen um, but from a comms point of view whether you insource that outsource that have a hybrid model the one thing that's really clear for businesses, including mine, is agility comes from everybody knowing what to do. Everybody knowing the individual actions. I'm not kicking the can up to somebody else who's gonna work it out. Everybody actually knowing how do I fit into the big strategy? Where are we going? Um, you know, I think our, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and even Jacinta Ardern called it the Team New Zealand or the Team Australia moment. Um, you know, for us, it's the Team Lend Lease moment. Does everybody know what they've got to do? Because we can't all be there together. Um, but that hybrid model, Annie, truly, I think there is a real a future for, for impact players to come in and out because like everybody, um, we've got a health crisis that may or not, may not have abated in our two countries. We're pretty lucky. But that economic crisis, I'm deep into that for the next couple of years. That's going to keep going. We haven't even seen the stimulus from both markets is still in play. We haven't even seen the underlying economic conditions. We don't know what that's going to look like. But I've watched this movie before. For those of us who have been around a while, the GFC hit, SARS hit. Um, that stuff lasts for years. Yeah. So we need to rethink the model um, and still be able to deliver. And Vanessa, to your point earlier, deliver more than we've ever delivered before. Exactly. And I think we're hearing that everywhere. And um, I'll just add, like, Contract over the last two months has had a 50% rise in professionals registering on the platform. That isn't unexpected. We have nearly 4,000 there um, to start with. But, um, you know, I suppose it does raise a question, and it's raised it as well, like, do you think the contract and project work portfolio careers and the mix of in-house and agencies is the way of the future? Are we moving quickly enough to be able to harness the impact players, whether they're within or, or outside our organisation. And yet, has COVID fast-tracked that in some way, do you think? So the real question is, what, what do you think the structure of the industry is going to look like? Is it going to be full-time employment and traditional careers, or is it going to be something different? Um, for, for at least, I'll, I'm going to answer that for one second. It depends on where you are in your career. Yeah. You know, if you're a deeply experienced player, um, and let's just have some practical reality. If you're deeply experienced, you don't really need to go to a bank and get a mortgage to show him your, your you know, 20 years of continual income because all of society has got to keep up with us on this journey. That, you know, if you're at the beginning of your journey, that may be very different to say you're, because do you have the skills to solve a problem? So it does, de does depend. I think people have to get really comfortable that the full-time in a company model probably is not going to be um, the model for everybody. It's probably really not. Um, and Anna said something earlier that was desperately insightful and I want to pick up on it about people self-skilling, making sure they've got the skills um, and what they're selling is their skill, um, but not by channel, not by this is what I've done, it's what problem I solved. Um, so I can solve that problem for you. But for me, it's where you are in your career, but I'll leave it to the experts because um, I'm certainly not one. 
Okay, um, Annie, what would, uh, Anna, what would you add to that in terms of what you think the, the future careers look like for us? So it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in one sense, we're saying that the discipline has grown, you know, in value. And in another, we're saying, but hang on a second, there may not be full-time opportunities in the same way. So I just want to make it really clear. I think that what we do as professionals and practitioners has never been so highly valued. I think we have a massive opportunity um, to continue rising. And there's a huge piece of research that the Page Institute uh, published uh, late last year, which was the result of interviewing something like 200 CEOs globally on the value of communication and a lot of it. And the, and the, the title of the report is um, the CCO as the pace setter. Um, and I think that there is absolutely no doubt that our function helps drive organisational change. It connects, you know, authentically, it connects organisations with purpose. Um, it enables um, that cohort that Louisa was talking about in terms of that connectivity. So what we're not talking about is the value of the discipline. What we're talking about is the structure in which we deliver on the discipline. And that's what we all have to be a lot smarter in terms of thinking about. So the, the biggest space that I see people um, and more so mid-level leaders get themselves caught in is the expectation that the organisation is there to serve them. Um, that is not the case, and that's a thing that we've got to come to, you know, come up to grips with pretty quickly. So, our roles are actually to help solve the organisation's problems. So we have to make sure that we are the ones that provide the value, and that we are the ones that do our homework. To Louise's earlier point around, um, you know, with the use of business metrics, etc., to make sure that we are of value. Now, how we provide and present that value will probably not be in the same structure that we did previously. We won't be going into an office and working nine to five. But that's not something to be fearful of because I think that there's still opportunities for us. We just have to start thinking about how we, how we enable that opportunity and what our value as professionals are to solving problems within large organisations. And if you are more of the sort of person that wants to be part of a team or part of a cohort, which most communicators are, there are going to be hundreds of those opportunities, but they might not work within the framework that you want them to work in. You know, I don't personally use the word balance because I don't really believe in balance. I think that, you know, the world these days is integrated into one and you create your own experience. If you're somebody that likes to compartmentalise things, I think that's difficult. It's going to be very difficult in a world that will demand that we fit in with it, not it fit in with us. And the two things will work, you know, simultaneously. I'm sorry, I'm not really answering that question. I just wanted to make sure that people... I am mindful of time. But there are, um, Annie, we do want to get to it, but um, we do have quite a number of questions that I'd like to get yes. to the audience. Yes. So um, there's a really great one here, a couple, about what do you see happening in the terms of specialists and generalist practitioners? Will we see the rise of specialists or is it better to be a jack of all trades like with that diversity? So you've all variously touched on it, but... Um, you know, people thinking about their career paths, should they be aiming to get a lot of experience? Should they, they be specialising? Um, what, what do you think your advice is? Do you, do you want to answer Annie or do you want me to have a yeah, go at yeah, it? Anna. Okay. So we, we have touched on this. Um, I think those of you who are specialists, it's wonderful to be specialists. Um, I do very much believe, though, that we need to be moving, shifting our mindsets into a problem-solving mindset. And I'm, you know, a big believer, as Louise will know, a lot of the work that I do is working with CEOs and executives on building function. Um, and I'm very proud to say that I was behind a lot of what Louise is leading now. But it, it is absolutely important to understand that there's one message and multiple channels. So trying very hard to use that mindset to solve organisational problems. So what I'm not saying is I'm not advocating for either specialisation or generalisation. What I'm saying is that no matter where you sit, you have to be in a position where you can hear and understand the problem and help solve the problem with a very broad mindset. Because even though it might be an internal focus, is internal comms, you've got to understand how that message is impacting or how you know, the government is impacting on that or how that might be impacting on what's actually told externally. 
So we did go many, many, many years ago. It was, we, you know, we moved very much from generalist to specialization. I think those, we, we, we're not operating like that anymore. We're operating in a problem solving frame. So try and lift yourself out of, oh my goodness, I'm a this, is, does that mean I'm not gonna have any capability or opportunity? More about what can I add to my suite so I actually provide a better solution that has a broader perspective that's been brought into the way that I answer it or help. And Annie, I'd love your view on that because you know that in lots of ways is the the, the critical part of agency is you know being able to be market facing, understanding what the challenges are, and then being able to build the capability to resolve those challenges. So what have you learned about generalization and specialists? Well, in some ways I'd relate it to like the IT sector. So in-house, you have your IT people, but you don't have Microsoft in, in-house, you don't have Google, you don't have Zoom, you know, you don't, you buy those particular services in. Um, and that's the same with communications. It's, you know, you have the people providing the structure and the goals, and then you bring in different people um, where and how is needed. And I think that question go to, goes back to where you're comfortable. If you're a person that's comfortable being a generalist and as Anna said, taking that problem, how can I, you know, um, we call it not a problem solver, Anna, we call it an entrepreneur. How can we <laughs> behave someone who <laughs> solves, <laughs> solves a problem in-house or you're an entrepreneur, someone who's from the outside. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it is about finding your, your bandwidth, your grit, and really working hard to know the impact that you can have. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to really touch on is um, 89 Degrees East works best for with organisations, not in a particular subject matter, not in a particular political zone. We work best when that communication function knows that we're not competition to them, we, that they know what they're looking for from us and demand it of us to deliver. And that, you know, from the CEO to the head of corporate comms, they're very comfortable in their role and not seeing the agency as, oh, everything's shit coming in and helping out or doing or whatever. So I think there's a huge responsibility there in that relationship management, both from the internal corporate government communication unit to when they bring people on board, be really clear about what they want help with and be not, not at all worried that mm. that's not something in their current toolbox, but they need it for now. Yeah. And for the agency also to come in and not say everything's terrible or, you know, you need to do this, this and this and focus on the task at hand to get the outcome that you want. Um, lots of people, um, and, you know, I know we all see it, like have that, and the top four consulting companies are really bad at it. They land and expand and they just try and do more and more to pile up the hours. And I can absolutely assure you after 10 years of doing that, my business prospers when we just focus on the task that's most needed to be done. And that I can say either we can do that or we can't do it, or I'm going to bolt someone on here and help you, but we're not trying to then do X, Y, Z and, and, and just continue to expand the brief and not get an outcome. So I think... Yeah, look, sorry. You go, Vanessa. Look, I think we've covered some really important points there. I think from Louise's earlier point, early in your career, it's so critical to get experience and to, you know, get as much experience as you do, as you can. Firstly, to understand what your strengths are, but secondly, to understand what is valued by your organisation. But then I think, you know, we've also said that to deliver fully integrated communication programs well, you need to have the right people doing the job. And that does require a mix of, you know, relationships and leadership, being able to pull those teams together, but having the deep specialisation so that you do have a digital marketer working on digital marketing you don't have a government relations person trying to fit that brief because that's a resource that you've got and I think we're all feeling it now that no matter how many people we have we don't always have the right people but being able to think flexibly and how you and I met met Annie was um you know being able to think well how could I do this differently if we can't do it ourselves so the other side um there is a really important question here I think and and Anna, if I'm correct, I think it was something you said. Jenny's asked the question. So sweat equity and self-care, how do they align? What, what does that mean? 
Louisa, you mentioned sweat equity, and I think I probably mentioned self-care, but do you want to have a go? Well, it's probably a question about, you yeah. know, I think the work-life balance, this is, this is your life and work fits into that. So you do yeah. need to decide, you know, what value you place on it and, and what effort you want to put into it. But it's a very important point. I think we have to be honest that every one is under enormous pressure and the demands do require significant effort. Um, but how does that work with self, self-care? And, and Louisa, I might start with you. I stopped talking about me working at home and there was a period of time I was just sleeping at work um, and you truly, the hours just expanded to every available time mm-hmm. and be honest, my psyche and lots of commerce people, I was needed. So I was answering the call. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's a very short term way of doing it. So I started claiming time back and it wasn't just physical time. I now do because no one cares where you are. I, I, my, some of my meetings are walking meetings where I'm in my neighbourhood. It's quite lovely where I live. Um, you know, I've got my earbuds in. I can still listen and I'm going to be able to get in some exercise because that's doing, you know, two things at once. Or I kept telling my team, particularly when your children were home and people were having all sorts of struggles, just turn it off. Do the most important things. You can get sucked into your inbox, guys, and you actually haven't done anything that day. So pick the things that are going to be the highest impact and do them. You must be the master of your own fate. Um, as a, you know, companies are going to suck the very marrow out of your bones. They just will because organisms do. Um, so as Anna said beautifully earlier, manage your own career. I, I overlay that, manage your own energy. I'm a high energy human. I've got an awful lot of it to give, but even I need to replenish this tank um, and I will find the ways through trial and error, to be perfectly blunt, no, no magic formula here, what works and what doesn't. Um, and people need to do that or else when your boss asks you to do something or see an opportunity, you just go, oh, it's one more thing yeah. to do. And you've run out of the, the oomph and the excitement and the passion and the grit um, the, just to say, yep, I'm going to take that on because you feel the energy for it. Um, so that's how I get there, but it's not it's not perfect. Anna, do you have anything to... I was just going to say, I, I call it ruthlessly prioritising because, again, um, communications is often the function that everything goes to that no one else can solve or that no one else knows how to solve. Yeah. And so we need to look after ourselves so we are the ones that have got the clear minds that can actually do that. Um, the way that I try to do it is by blocking you know, time out in my calendar that works for me. So a lot of you would know that I work very late at night, particularly because I work on a global um, time zone clock. And that might mean that I'm doing something for myself first thing in the morning. You know, what I try very hard not to do is start very early and go very late every single day because days and nights and weekends all turn into one. And I started noticing that, you know, you do start to um, lose perspective. And when we are at either end of the zone, we're either bored and not engaged or we're at burnout um, because we're over-engaged. Our presence and the way that we come across um, is, is much worse than what it needs to be. And I think as professionals that provide um, judgment information to mitigate against risk in large organisations, we need to be on our best um, as much as we can. So it's, and this is where that whole burnout piece comes from. And this is where we need to, um, as individuals and leaders, manage ourselves, not look to other people like Louisa's in your function to be telling you, you know, that that's enough. You need to know how to prioritise and manage yourself. I feel like I can really answer this question a lot coming from Byron Bay where it's all about your energy. Um, But, you know, being really clear about where you get your energy from, your good energy, and pushing away bad energy, people who want to whinge and complain about things. Even clients can be like that who just want to take your time and um, whinge and not be focused on the solutions. Um, So I, my whole um, MO is to find smart people find good people and just like work with them, interact with them because that gives me really good energy and ideas. And the other thing, and I know I jokingly said when Vanessa said to move to Byron Bay or move to a um, rural area, but the truth is I, you know, I used to travel each fortnight and obviously I haven't been doing that now, Um, but I am at my creative problem solving best 
when I'm at my best and in Byron Bay, in, you know, doing the lighthouse walk, um, giving myself time, I will come up with the best creative solutions, strategic ideas in that zone. So it's actually, it's not just, oh, you know, uh, important to self-care and survive. It's actually, this is how you get your best ideas. This is how you actually, so find what it is, whether, it, and because for everyone it's different, that gives you your best energy and give makes you perform at your best. And when you're performing at your best, you're more relaxed and less stressed when you're doing things, you know, that Vishu was saying about, you know, she was in need, she was in demand, she was at her best, she's high energy. Um, I totally get that. Um, and so it's when you're not doing things that you're good at, when you're surrounded by negative people, you're not giving yourself doing the things that you love and that, you know, spark your joy, dare I say, but it is true. It impacts on your work and um, your whole persona. Very good. Um, welcome, Tanya. It's lovely to have you. Great. Oh, what a fascinating, brilliant conversation. We could have kept on going. And I have to say we are actually on two o'clock, which is very not good for the circle because we always um, finish on time. But that, that is just testimony to you guys how brilliant this conversation was and we've got about 10 more questions sitting in the Q&A box so there's obviously much more of this conversation to to be have I really want to thank you Vanessa this started off as a conversation between you and me and um, of course driven by the incredible team behind us and that's uh, Tracy Jennings I do want to pay tribute to Ann Wickham who is from Boxing Clever and been part of our circle for many years and she really helped us get this corporate affairs series off the ground and I think we're on to something ladies and I think we have to continue the conversation there's a lot to be said you guys are on the front line um, everyone comes to you and um, I think this is really worth much more than um, just this hour. So we uh, promise to you is that we're going to continue these conversations. So Anna, Louisa, Vanessa and Annie, thank you so much for being with us and to all of our guests. We had a great guest list. Um, so we've just got to get you to fill in this business sentiment poll quickly. I don't need to read the questions. You're all great readers. Um, if you can submit your answers and we will come up with that live straight away. Um, so on behalf of all of us, we really want to thank you for being with us, for giving of your time, your insights, your heart um, and your intelligence. And uh, we very much hope to do this again. So these are the poll results. Most of us are feeling challenged. Government's doing good job, good, 78% and still 12 months to go. And will the trans bubble provide benefit to your business? Yes, that's good. Good news, 52%. And of course, the one that we love the most is did the event today meet your objectives? So thank you very much. 100% of you loved it. Come back and we'll see you next time. Thanks for being with The Circle today. Thank you.